For a lot of fans, Iron Man will always be the face of the MCU. Watching Tony Stark's journey all the way from the first Iron Man to Endgame was packed with thrills, chills, huge highs, and some pretty sad lows. But one thing fans have noticed is that while Tony often faced big failures and faulty designs in his Iron Man suits, he ended up fixing those issues the next time around. Today's video is all about Tony Stark's biggest suit failures and how those eventually were fixed in unique and creative ways. This is going to be a lot of fun. Let's get started. Got any other bad ideas? I want to start off by highlighting a heartbreaking feature to the Iron Man suits as well as the Spider-Man suits that Tony created. You all remember Captain America's Civil War, right? You know, the one where our favorite Avengers beat up each other relentlessly and then were so fractured that later Thanos was able to waltz right in and wipe out half the universe? Yeah, that one. Anyways, the big selling point for that film is the giant airport fight which saw Tony Stark's group take on Captain America's group. Everyone ended up hurt in some capacity here, but obviously it's clear who the biggest loser was. While Captain America was flying away, Iron Man and War Machine were hot on his trail. Sam Wilson flew in to start running interference, leading to War Machine asking Vision to shoot Falcon down. Now, you could argue that Vision really should have perfect aim given his advanced powers paired with the Mind Stone, but he was also in a slightly compromised position where he was holding Wanda, the woman he loves. We know Wanda is the only one to make him a little frazzled. I mean, just look at the What If episode that dealt with zombies to see just how far Vision's love for Wanda will go. So he probably wasn't in the best mindset to shoot down an enemy. He fired a beam at Sam, who dodged it pretty easily, resulting in the blast hitting War Machine's armor in just the right spot that shut down the suit. Tony had to watch his friend plummet to the earth in a suit of Tony's own design. That had to be painful. Rhodey ended up alive and overall eventually got better, but for a while he was paralyzed. So how did Tony fix this in later suits? By making sure every everyone came with a built-in parachute. This is showcased in Spider-Man Homecoming when Peter first fights the Vulture. Adrian Toomes snatches Peter and starts taking him to a higher altitude to presumably drop him. Once they reach a certain height and Peter has no control, his suit deploys an automatic parachute. Now, this parachute doesn't necessarily work perfectly as Peter gets a little tangled in it, but it's the thought that counts, right? Tony wants to make sure his friends using his technology are never left in the position Rhodey was in again. I wouldn't be surprised if War Machine's new armor has a parachute that works independently of the suit's power core, just in case power is ever severed again. I want to take us all the way back to the first Iron Man film, where we got to see a suit issue that Tony dealt with not only get fixed in the same movie, but also helped him defeat the film's overall big bad. In the film, when Tony was making his suits for the first time, his Mark II armor was the first one to be able to fly properly. But there was an issue. It faced an icing problem. Higher altitudes caused atmospheric icing and for the suit to overall freeze and malfunction. If you want to get technical beyond just saying, hey, it's pretty cold up in the sky, I can explain how that Mark II was created using a chromed titanium steel alloy. Well, obviously, as we all know, the solution for this is to use gold titanium alloy instead with ceramic plating and silicon-infused steel. As Tony puts it in the movie, they used the same gold titanium alloy from a satellite in order to help it not freeze. And then in some techno babble, Tony mentions how using this ensures fuselage integrity and maintains power-to-weight ratio. Yeah, because we all past science in high school and understand all that, right? Hmm. Well, if not, then I prefer a much simpler explanation of previous suit bad, new suit good. And then this factored into the final fight when Tony was fighting Obadiah Stain in his Iron Monger suit. Although Stain's suit seemed to be more of a powerful weapon, it still was made from the old prototypes, which means the icing problem hadn't been fixed yet. It caused Stain to come crashing down to Earth in spectacular fashion. The reason this moment worked so well is that it presented a difficult problem for Tony Stark to overcome at the beginning, had him fix it in an intelligent way that only he could, and then used that weakness on a stronger opponent in order to come out victorious. It's a testament to Stark's character and his genius level intellect. You think when Tony was making his early suits, he ever imagined just how epic his journey would be? Yes, he wanted to be a hero and help people thanks to his life-changing experience in the cave, but if you would have told him that he'd eventually be fighting in something called Infinity War for the fate of half the universe while being on the same team as a god of thunder, a rampaging angry green monster, a talking raccoon, and a guy who could shrink himself down to the size of an ant, he'd probably call you delusional and then make a pop culture reference of some sort. But I think the MCU handled the transition from Earthbound 
found many adventures to fighting for the sake of the universe rather well. All I'm saying is the next feature highlights just how big the universe got for Tony Stark. At the end of the Avengers, when aliens are attacking New York, the frightened World Security Council decided instead of letting the Avengers do their thing and save the day, that it would just be better to blow up New York instead. As Nick Fury would say, it was a stupid decision. And as much as Fury tried to blow the rocket out of the sky, he didn't succeed, meaning Tony Stark had to make a split-second decision. Earlier in the movie, Captain America called Tony out for never being the guy to make the sacrifice play and always finding some loophole out of it. Well, Tony proved him wrong here by taking the missile and guiding it through the wormhole to blow up all the aliens on the other side. Being in space caused Tony's suit to malfunction and caused Tony to black out, only barely making it back through to New York. During this oxygen-deprived situation, Tony's anxiety and fear of the big one officially started, and it shaped who he was as a hero for the rest of the franchise. But on top of that, he learned that his suit should probably be able to operate in space. As evidenced by Infinity War, Tony upgraded his suit so that he could actually operate in the cosmos without passing out immediately. Good call, Tony. And side note, I'm just overall sad we never got to see a full functional Iron Man spacesuit. Yes, it worked in small doses, but I don't think Tony could just hop into a suit and fly to Neptune for a weekend trip with Elon Musk. There were once rumors before the movie came out that Iron Man 3 would end with a post credit scene of Tony flying up into space in a new suit and meeting the Guardians of the Galaxy. Hey, maybe we can see that in a What If episode. The next one is another Iron Man suit failure that Tony ended up fixing for Spider-Man's suit, but you could easily make the case that he upgraded his own suit as well. Iron Man 3 is one of the most controversial movies in the MCU. Unlike Iron Man 2 or Thor The Dark World, which both are almost universally agreed to be disappointments, Iron Man 3 I think you'll find an even split of people who either think it's in the top 5 best MCU films or the top 5 worst. No one seems to think that it's just okay. Sure, it's not as a powerful of a divide like The Last Jedi, but let's be honest, nothing is going to be. Iron Man 3, more so than anything, was about Tony Stark's anxiety and fear and whether Tony could be Tony Stark without the Iron Man suit. This meant that a lot of the time had to be spent with just Tony Stark rather than Iron Man, which led to the mid-movie surprise where Tony passes out in the suit and Jarvis ends up whisking him off to the middle of the Arctic. Oh, what? He didn't go to the Arctic? That's just what Tennessee weather is like in the winter? Oh, hard pass. Might as well be the Arctic. Anyway, when Tony woke up, he was in the middle of that frozen landscape and had to lug his suit to find someone who could help him. Well, obviously, Tony wanted to do something about the cold, because in Spider-Man's suit, it came with a built-in heater. That's better, thanks. And so did presumably every Iron Man suit that came after. I'm sure inside those super suits gets really hot and sweaty, but a built-in heater for when you get trapped in a winter wonderland will always be helpful. I know that I kind of harped on Iron Man 2 in the last one, and I stand by that it's a disappointing sequel, but I do find Tony's journey to find a new element to help save his life a sort of interesting plot development, and I think it works well enough to be included on this list. So when Tony first designed his Iron Man suit, he had a palladium-based reactor in his chest, and that was slowly poisoning him, especially given that using the suit was causing the poison to work faster. So definitely that counts as a failure, and then Tony had to go on his own journey to fix it. At that time, he was looking for a suitable replacement material for the reactor's core, but no known element was compatible. In a questionable plot point, Tony watched an old home video where Howard Stark hinted that there was a clue hidden in the Stark Expo model. Then, Tony discovered that the buildings actually made up the atomic structure of a new element, which Tony then synthesized and used to create a brand new arc reactor. Like, sure, it does make sense since Howard was the one studying the Tesseract and wanted to keep his idea a secret for only Tony to work out, but, I don't know, hiding the answer in a model of the Stark Expo? That seems a little needlessly complicated. But hey, Howard was a kooky guy. But overall, this was another instance of Tony needing to fix a problem with his suit and then coming out stronger because of it. So this one I thought was interesting to think about, because yes, Ultron was an evil creation and almost destroyed Earth in this universe, as well as becoming the ultimate threat across the multiverse in What If, but I think you could argue that Ultron was an upgrade after Tony Stark's failures with AI and the Iron Legion in Iron Man 3. 
Let me explain a bit. In Iron Man 3, Tony Stark started experimenting a lot with his Iron Legion Force. He was dealing with his trauma by creating suit after suit, but I think this had a lot of limitations. For one, the quality of these suits seemed to be suffering, as evidenced by how after saving everyone from the plane playing the biggest game of Barrel Full of Monkeys ever, the suit broke apart after being hit by a truck. And even getting through that whole situation was a dilemma, as Tony was trying to be in two places at once. But then, in Age of Ultron, Tony wanted to upgrade his Iron Legion even more by having it be smart enough to work independently without him. And even though the results were devastating, you have to admit that his beginning goal of creating an intelligent enough AI that could work by itself after going through the trial and error process of remote control suits in Iron Man 3 was overall a success. Sure, that success almost led to everyone being wiped out, but still, I think it counts. Hmm, okay, this is just sounding like I support Ultron and I find that pretty problematic. I think it's safe to say that Tony Stark got his butt kicked by Thanos. Even with his fancy nanotech suit, he still wasn't a match for the Mad Titan and mostly only was able to draw a drop of blood. But this harrowing defeat that led to the universe being decimated and Tony Stark on a ship playing games with Nebula for weeks led to the creation of arguably the most powerful Iron Man suit of all time. Even though Tony spent a lot of time recovering and giving up and saving everyone, when they got the chance to retrieve the stones from different points in time, the fire reignited within him. It led to him making a new Infinity Gauntlet that was capable of containing and harnessing the stone's power. Sure, it didn't really work out for him because he still ended up in that great iron scrap heap in the sky, but I think it goes to show that if Tony had ended up surviving the snap, the next suit he would have made would have been basically on a god tier level, don't you think? He would have found a way to make a suit that could harness the Infinity Stones without harming the user. At least, that's what I think. I think one of the funniest moments in the first Avengers movie is that when Tony gets zapped by Thor's lightning, it doesn't end up hurting, but rather ends up charging his suit and making Tony more powerful. And I would like to think this is because of Tony's experience with Whiplash in Iron Man 2. Whiplash is nobody's favorite villain, but he did wield a unique weapon set that did end up hurting Iron Man's suit. I'm sure there's a deleted scene out there somewhere that sometime in between Iron Man 2 and the Avengers, Tony remembered the sting of getting electrocuted, so he fixed his suit in order to handle handle that better. So when the God of Thunder came to Earth, it was a happy coincidence. We saw the Hulkbuster armor a few times in the MCU. The first time was to fight the Hulk, the other times it was piloted by Bruce Banner because the Hulk wouldn't come out to play, which is kind of funny if you think about it. But I do think you saw a definite improvement from the first Hulkbuster to the second one. Even though the Hulkbuster was designed to take down the Hulk, in Age of Ultron the two seemed pretty evenly matched. So you have to imagine the second version that we saw in Infinity War was even stronger. And it's been argued that the Hulkbuster we saw in Infinity War wasn't even being used to its full potential. People argue that if Tony was making nanobot suits at this time, then that would mean the Hulkbuster should have been outfitted with some of that latest technology. But it was only because Banner was an inexperienced pilot of the armor that we didn't see any fancier gadgets and moves. I believe that, don't you? For one of the last entries, I want to go back to the beginning of Iron Man's career. In the first Iron Man, Tony was seriously struggling with taking the suit on and off again. There's even that very funny moment with Pepper when she walks into one of the armor removal scenes and he quips how that wasn't one of the worst things she's walked in on him doing. But taking the armor on and off again seemed like a bit of a pain in the first film, which is why the upgrade in the second movie is my favorite. One of his new suits in that sequel comes from a suitcase, and that suit-up scene is just a highlight of the film. It's definitely much easier than having robots painfully attach bits of armor to you. And sure, it might take a little bit for the suitcase armor to be complete, leaving Tony wide open to attack if his enemies are like me and freeze whenever Tony is suiting up, but it's worth it for such a cool hero moment. We'd see this skill get upgraded a lot in every passing movie, but I think the suitcase armor is the most clever use of getting the suit to Tony without it bleeding over to the realm of magic nanobots. And speaking of nanobots and nanotech, I'll end this video talking about that magical fix-all. Tony definitely came a long way from the first Iron Man movie. First, his suits were grounded in realism, and then they ended with him having specialty nanotech and nanobots that could create literally any weapon he wanted with just a thought. But I've heard the argument that the upgrade from regular suits to nanotech was actually partially caused by Tony's loss in Civil War and Ant-Man is even to blame? Well, on some level it makes sense. During the airport fight, Ant-Man was 
was able to shrink and sneak into Iron Man's suit, causing a lot of damage as he started unplugging things and generally causing a big ruckus. It caused Tony's suit to malfunction, leading to Tony having to flush Ant-Man out of his system. But think about this huge security breach. If Ant-Man really wanted to, he could have become Giant Man inside Tony's armor and then Tony probably wouldn't have survived. That would have been an embarrassing way for Earth's greatest protector to end his time in the MCU. I think besides all the fancy new weapons, the nanotech specifically stops attackers like Ant-Man from infiltrating the suit, which is an incredibly valuable upgrade. It also reinforces what the show What If tried to tell us, that someone with shrinking abilities is probably the greatest threat if they used it for malicious intent. I'm just saying Ant-Man probably would have had a better chance to beat Thanos than Iron Man did on Titan. Do you think War Machine got all these upgrades too? I don't know about you guys, but I'm worried about Rhodey now that Tony Stark is gone. Who's building and fixing his suits? Who's going to supply him all the latest tech necessary to fight bad guys? That's the biggest question that I want the upcoming Armor Wars to answer. 